The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. This is a literature short. These are short videos to revise each chapter of Jekyll and Hyde and today we're looking at chapter 7, The Incident at the Window. We'll look briefly at the events of the chapter and then at some of the language used. This is a very short chapter but it doesn't mean it's any less important in terms of language and events. So let's move over here now to start with events. The chapter starts on a Sunday morning. Utterson and Enfield are on their usual walk. They stop at a door, the same blistered and disdained door from chapter one, which we know Hyde had entered to get the money for the girl's family following the trampling. Enfield comments that the story's at an end and that they will never see more of Hyde. Utterson explains that he once saw Hyde and shared Enfield's feeling of repulsion. Utterson and Enfield decide to go to see Dr Jekyll. They think it might do him good to see a friend. They enter the courtyard. In one of the windows, Utterson spots Dr Jekyll. Jekyll explains that he is very low. Utterson invites Jekyll out for a walk, but Jekyll politely declines and also says that his place is not fit for him to invite Utterson and Enfield up to see him. So they decide to chat from the courtyard. However, almost immediately, something terrible comes over Jekyll's face and he disappears from sight. Utterson and Enfield are very shaken by what they have seen. Utterson says, God forgive us, twice, and the two men walk on in silence. Let's move over here to examine some of the features of this chapter. We'll start with Stevenson's use of time. Something that's worth pointing out is the way that events and circumstances change with varying pace in this novel. And that's really shown in chapter 7. Of course, we know that the shift in Jekyll occurs over a much broader time scale, but Stevenson shows the shock of several abrupt realisations in both his narrative structure and his language. This chapter is incredibly short. It's only about 500 words long, and yet Stevenson takes Enfield and Utterson from a place of innocence to a situation in which they are scarred for life by the horror of what they have seen. The length of this chapter is critical to this. We know that Stevenson plays around with time in the novella more generally. The sequence of chapters, for example, means that the entire storyline is kept from us until the very end, and we're left in the dark as readers, just as Utterson and Enfield were. The awful realisation of what has happened unfurls for the reader, just as it does for these men. Time between the chapters varies too. There are huge expanses of time between some chapters and hardly any between others. For example, chapters one and two occur in the same day, and then we leap forwards a fortnight for the third chapter, and then nearly a year for the next chapter. We have large gaps to fill. We can only imagine how the demonic side of Hyde has developed in this time, and we'll talk a little more about the impact on the reader of holding back information and making the reader fill these gaps shortly. Now the focus of this video is chapter 7, so let's look at the time frame here. In this chapter, something so profound and significant takes place in a very short time frame, and we get a real sense of the one-way nature of time here. Utterson and Enfield can never unsee the terrible sight they've seen, and the horror of this is brought home to the reader by the sudden nature of it, which is also, reaff which is also reinforced through the juxtaposition with the calm equilibrium of their amiable walk at the start, their silence immediately after, and the abrupt end to the chapter. Let's have a look at some of the language here too. We're going to look at the description of the courtyard, and just in case you're not sure what this means, a courtyard is an area around the back of houses, so often several houses would back onto one area, one communal area. And there's a very eerie sense to this courtyard, and it's in this chapter that we learn that the building of the mystery door is also connected to Jekyll's house. Remember, you know the ending of the story because you've read the book before and studied it, and this novel is so famous that some people even know this without ever reading it. But when the text was new to people, this would have felt like a mystery being pieced together chapter by chapter. I'll just put the quotation up. The court was very cool and a little damp and full of premature twilight, although the sky, high up overhead, was still bright with sunset. I would like to draw your attention to the beautifully crafted contrast in these two sentences. Nothing feels very concrete here, Perhaps we're getting a sense of Hyde simply from the way Stevenson 
pulls us in different directions with the language. As readers, we're being asked to process so much that the result is one of immersion into a multi-dimensional sensory experience. I should be really clear here that I'm referring to the way that each description in that quotation works alongside other descriptions. So the relationship between each word or phrase within that quotation is crucial to the overall effect. We're asked to take on board that the court was very cool, which is simple enough to understand, but then it's also a little damp. So Stevenson's starting to layer up the gradations of adjectives here. Very cool, a little damp. And then we get to full of premature twilight. Now this is brimming with imagery. Premature tells us that twilight has come early, but it's more than just early. It sounds undeveloped and lacking somehow. Um, remember twilight is the period before dusk, just when the sun is going down. It's gentle light and dim, but also reputed to feel a little bit eerie, a little bit creepy, and the court is full of it. So to me this is really a juxtaposition in itself. But Stevenson goes one step further to reinforce this mystical place, for we, we learn that the sky was still bright with sunset. So the court has its own light, distinct from the rest of the sky, almost as though it's operating separately to the rest of the world's time frame. The rest of the sky is bright and positive, while this place is disturbing, it's intense, it's contradictory to the world outside. So while each of these phrases may not look significant as an each independent unit, the combination of them to make the whole is really significant. I'm going to put another quotation up over here. The middle one of these three windows was halfway open, and sitting close beside it, taking the air with an infinite sadness of mien, like some disconsolate prisoner, Utterson saw Dr Jekyll. Now we're told about the presence of three windows, three times in this whole novel, um, although it's clear that there are windows from Jekyll's quarter which are dusty and hides which are clean, you can look back to the story of the door and the incident of the letter for these two descriptions. But let's pause here too because it may be an apt place to remember that in the first chapter we are told that the buildings are so packed together about the court that it's hard to say where one ends and another begins. Now that we look back on this, we understand the significance of the buildings in relation to their inhabitants and how Jekyll and Hyde are one. The clues are there from the very start, which is particularly brilliant to reflect upon now, I think. Now here, Jekyll has an air of infinite sadness, and that's really quite significant. The sadness sprawls before him forever, and he's disconsolate. That means nothing can comfort him at all. The image of this miserable man sitting in the premature twilight of the court like a prisoner is incredibly striking. Yet we have worse to come, and here's the real craft of Stevenson, for he tells us a lot without saying much at all. We're simply told that Jekyll's face is crossed with an expression of such abject terror and despair as froze the very blood of the two gentlemen below. There's no need for gory descriptions here, and as we mentioned earlier with the expanses of time between chapters, for us the horror becomes very real. Our imaginations can create scenarios much worse than words on a page can. The man's reactions to Jekyll tell us that they must have seen something that shook them to the bone, but we're left to imagine what that could have been. Stevenson writes that the glimpse had been sufficient. They're both pale as they leave, and Utterson's cry to God at the end, God forgive us, God forgive us, tells us that they have seen something most unnatural and most unholy. That's all for now. I'll be back soon with chapter eight. I hope you're all well. Thanks for watching and goodbye.